So this is the first video for my writing, studying, studying, writing, whatever we want to call it, vlogs. Um, so this is very exciting. I am so looking forward to this. The first thing I need to do, however, is move all this and dust. So come along with me. to get your desk situated for ideal studying. Here's a little tip if you're planning on studying anything. Keep it simple. Declutter your desk. Keep it simple to the point of just the things you need, absolutely need. Oh, and the most important thing, put your phone away. Thank goodness I record on my phone because I won't be able to touch it. So since I'm just starting out, there isn't much that is all that interesting to show. But what I have learned is that the first recorded mythology was found in 1840 from archaeologists in Iraq. Uh, and it was recorded in cuneiform, which if you don't know what cuneiform is, I'll put some on the screen here for you to see. Um, but and then apparently this myth, this story, is called the... See, I cannot pronounce it, and they don't add pronunciation in this book, which is one of the things I'm not happy about. Um, so I'm not sure about this book, but it's a good start. Um, so it's you, Enuma Elish, Enuma Elish, E N U M A E L I S H. In 1902 which is like 62 years later, the Germans started an evacuation in another city nearby and found it another version of the same myth and was basically identical except for the name of the god. So what they're hypothesizing is that two different um, races of people had the same story within their tribes or neighborhoods or whatever it was but because they had different faiths, they had different names for the god. So that's interesting. I'm sorry for my squeaky chair. It is barely used. It's basically brand new and it's already squeaking. I don't know why, but after my surgery, I'm gonna figure it out. I need to think of a way to bring mythology learning to more than just reading a book. Um, I know that's a lot of things that I would get if I was actually in college, but since I'm doing this myself now, I need to come up with some sort of like exercise so that it's not just me reading story and reading words because I need them to stick. Um, so if you guys have any suggestions on either books to read, um, movies to watch, you know, any of this kind of stuff that might help me with this, so with like kind of modules for myself, please let me know in the comments. The other issue that I'm having, I think, is that it is a library book and it's, I mean, it's thick. I mean, it's a thick book. It's like almost 600 pages. Um, and I'm most likely not going to read the whole thing before it's due back at the library on July 11th. Um, <clears throat> so I'm thinking I need to find a way to maybe make a copy of the book. Um, or, you know, check to see what's the most important things to read in the book so I can skip around. Uh, what I would love, absolutely love, is if I could get one of those, um, like paper, you know, those tablets that look like paper, because <clears throat> I follow some people on YouTube who have that tablet and you're able to, um, like scan the page of a book and then it puts it into the tablet like a book, like an ebook, but you can like write on it and stuff. That would be perfect, honestly, but that's a $500 tablet. So that's a pipe dream at the moment, but we'll see what we can do. So that's one of the challenges I'm facing um, with learning myself, teaching myself, is the fact that I'm using library books that have to be back, you know, within only, only a few weeks. I can extend the um, time that I, I borrow the book, but 
I don't want to do that too much because even though it is kind of like a textbook, there are people out there that may want to read it and use it for their own stuff. So I got to think of some things, some ways to get past that challenge, as well as the challenge of needing to exercise what I'm learning so that I don't lose it. That is where I am at the moment. I'm going to get back to studying. Um, it is currently 11.15, so I'm just going to go into lunchtime because um, I cannot skip lunch because I didn't eat breakfast. Okay, a couple more things I learned. Um, and we're going to try to sit forward so that this chair shuts up. Squeak, 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 squeak. Uh, it's not like there's a mouse in my chair. Let me get you guys a little higher here. Okay. I learned that there was a thing called pyramid texts, um, which recorded all important religious ideas in for the Egyptians. And they called it that because it was right after the construction of the pyramids. They also, interestingly, Egyptians lived in isolation for hundreds of years um they didn't have any outside influence from other countries or any you know race of people i find that very interesting and as an introvert relatable <laughs> um so it's it's kind of intriguing to me that that's something i've never heard of before the historians and stuff might not think it's the most important fact i guess when talking about the egyptians but i think it's kind of really important that they didn't have any outside influence for hundreds of years especially with all the things that we know about the egyptians and like all the things we do now that came from the egyptians like you know owning pets and all that kind of stuff which maybe that's why they started owning pets because they didn't have you know a lot of outside friends or anything like that um, or relationships. So maybe that's part of the reason they started owning pets, which interesting, um, interesting theory on my part there. Don't know if it's true. Don't know if I could ever prove it, but, um, okay. And then the other thing I learned, there is a, let me go back to the actual page. There is something called, and again, there is no pronunciation help in this book. So if I'm saying it wrong, oh, well, tell a panu. It says, this hit, hit, hitate, maybe, nature myth fits the pattern of the god who disappears, causing the earth to become barren. It contains the ritual for restoring the presence of the god and with his presence fertility. Like other myths of its pattern, the Telepanu myth could account for the changing seasons in nature because it emphasizes the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So basically they're saying that this telepanu is the reason we have fall springs fall winter spring and summer i found that interesting too because again something i never knew and i'm only on well now i'm on page 26 and look at all the stuff i'm already learning i mean it's crazy the things that they don't tell you about mythology unless you're actually learning it you know unless you're actually in a class or whatever so I found that very, very interesting, but I'm thinking I might stop for today. I haven't really been going for too long. Um, and I, I have sort of skipped a little because there are like within each myth, there are paragraphs that are just like, <sighs> so I have skipped a little and kind of just gotten the important information, which is why I only have one page of uh, notes. The way that this book is written, there are some paragraphs that are just unnecessary you know information that we really don't need because i've been skipping over those and i don't know if that's my editor brain and it's not the topic it's just the way it's written um so i tend to find myself kind of looking over because i have diagnosis murder on the tv so i kind of like i'm like getting to those paragraphs and kind of like shifting my focus um and i know a lot of people will say well turn the tv off but i cannot I cannot do anything in silence. It's just not possible. So it's either TV or music and music is way more distracting for me. Um, so I, I am going to put the mythology away and pick up this book because I'm thinking about 
writing a mystery because it is one of my favorite genres. As I said, had Diagnosis Murder on TV right now. Before Diagnosis Murder, it was Murder, She Wrote. And after Diagnosis Murder, it's Monk. So obviously, love this genre of everything. Um, and I've wanted to write a mystery for forever. And I did start one, but it just, it was more like a cozy mystery and it just didn't hit the way I wanted it to. So I think what I'm going to do is use this as a little bit of inspiration. Not too much, um, just more like the ins and outs of writing mystery. I think I'm going to open, crack open this book and see if I can even concentrate on it. to move to the couch because this book doesn't really require me taking a lot of notes and the chair is squeaky and uncomfortable. That doesn't really actually say who said it but somebody says I'm a big fan on finding the right name for your sleuth. I've encountered other writers who can commit to going forward with their tale with XXX as a temporary character name to be filled in later but for me the drive to write a story doesn't go smoothly without the proper moniker. While I don't agree with that in most cases I do agree with that for mysteries, especially for the detective of any kind, because often the name is part of the personality. So, like, in, in, in here it brings up Sherlock Holmes, which is a great example. The name Sherlock holds some kind of personality trait. I mean, we don't think about it because we think, oh, it was created by Doyle because his name is Sherlock we now attribute that but honestly it's not that case so the name Sherlock brings forward grace and um fame and fortune although not quite so much with Sherlock Holmes but the name Sherlock definitely makes you think he's like some sort of high society important person so that draws you in and then, of course, Doyle decided to go completely the other direction and completely obliterate all of those <laughs> um, thoughts on the name. So, because, I mean, yeah, he's smart and he's, you know, important, but Sherlock has his problems. And that's part of his character personality, which he wouldn't be Sherlock Holmes without them. And I think that might be one of my problems with writing mystery is that I didn't really think about that aspect. I just kind of jumped in with the crime. I wasn't really worried about the character so much. Um, it was the location and the crime for me that was the important stuff. And I think that's where I went wrong. I think I need to worry about the character first. And I think that's one of the problems sometimes with cozy mysteries is that the sleuth especially doesn't, they're just an everyday person with an everyday name and there's nothing really all that special about them. Um, I mean, there are some exceptions, you know, some of them are like murder she wrote she's she was a, a mystery writer so that makes sense but even her name i don't know really holds much i mean she uses jb fletcher for her books and she's jessica fletcher every day and i don't know that that really holds much of her personality in it it's just that's her name you know um so i'm not sure whether the name comes into play even with Murder, She Wrote, but definitely the olden time detectives um, like Sherlock Holmes and all of Agatha Christie's, their names definitely played a part. I mean, whose name is Her Hercule Poirot? Poirot. Poirot. <laughs> I can never say it. I can say it in my head, but I can never say it out loud. But seriously, who has that kind of name? I mean... You think that name, you think Agatha Christie, you know, and 
I, I feel like that definitely is one of my weaknesses. So I think that's something that I can kind of learn and train myself to do going forward with mysteries is that the character arc and the character information is just as important as the, the crime and the location and all that. Um, so I think I definitely need to strengthen my characters. So I did learn something from this, so that's good. Um, I'm on page 25. I'm going to finish out this chapter, which ends on page 33. And then I'm going to stop for today because I have to start getting some stuff ready for tomorrow for the surgery. And that includes packing a bag, even though it is an outpatient procedure. I will just feel better if I have a bag packed just in case. So as you saw on the next page, it said something about Jessica Fletcher, and it says, why are so many people killed in the seaside village of Cabot Cove? Um, so they actually explain this, which is interesting, because this is always something that my mom and I point out, like, why are so many people she knows dies, um, or are accused of killing the victim? And it says that it's actually something that the writers do for mysteries to keep you engaged. So that's interesting. There's actually a point behind it. And then the rest of the pages of the chapter were just, like, types of sleuths you can have and what their powers are, their challenges, their advantages, stuff like that. So the rest of the chapter went pretty quickly. But the one thing that I did really enjoy reading is um, there's a section in here and it's just talking about different types of sleuths. But then at the bottom it says questions to ask when developing a sleuth. So there's who do you personally root for? What kind of people do you root for? How do you or people around you feel misunderstood? What is your character's superpower? What is your character's Achilles heel? And what is your character's biggest fear? So I like those questions and I think I am going to actually write those down um, to see if maybe that'll help me. So that was, you know, intriguing. So now it's lunchtime and I said I would include a clip. So let's go get some lunch.